If you have your Bibles today, Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. Just one verse today. Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 13. Had a really wonderful revival. Enjoyed having Brother Wayne with us. And, uh, of course, he stays in the home with us when he's here. And uh, I can tell you, uh, he lives what he preaches. And uh, just a dynamite preacher, dynamite uh, man of God to be around and challenge me for all week. And, and I certainly want to be a blessing to you this morning. And I want to preach a message that I have entitled, The Heart is Key. The Heart is Key. I want us to look there in Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 13. God is speaking to Jerusalem. Uh, He is speaking to the children of Israel, God's chosen people. The Bible says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Let me read that again so we can let this sink in. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips, do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Well, what are we talking about here? Who is he talking to? He's talking to God's chosen people. He's talking about the people of God. He's talking about the Jews. He's talking about His chosen people who uh, had seen miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. They had seen God move time and time again. And here they are, several years later, after being delivered from Egypt, they are now, uh, have strayed away from God. And God uses the language, He states that they had removed their heart from God. I'm going to think about that. How important is the heart to God? If you do any careful study of Scripture, you will understand the title of this sermon And that is, the heart is key. The heart is key. God is concerned with the heart. I want to ask you a question today. I didn't ask you if you tithe. I didn't ask you if you faithfully attend our church. I did not ask you if you're a good person. I did not ask you if you help uh, the older elderly across the street. I did not help you. Uh, I'm not asking you all those things. I'm asking you a question that you need to answer. God already knows the answer to. I ask you this morning, how is your heart? Who are you really? Well, that's who the heart is. You say, what is the heart? When the Bible talks about the heart over and over and over again, the word heart in the Bible, it means your innermost being of person. It's the place of desire. It's the real you. It's who you are in the dark. When nobody at church is looking, when pastor's not looking, when your children and when your kids, when your parents are not watching, who are you? You may be here today dressed to the T and have everybody fooled. Maybe your lips even praise God, but in the inside you're as dark as a room with no lights. How is your heart? Who are you? God is concerned with your heart. You see, if our heart is right, then the other will be right. If my heart is right with God, I will give to God. If my heart is right with God, I will be faithful to my local church. If my heart is right with God, I will say and do the things God has told me to do. You see, the heart is key. And we're going to look at that. Let's pray this, this, this morning and pray God will bless this sermon. Father, I pray that you would bless the preaching of your word. This is not my word, it is your word. And I pray that you would challenge your people. As you have challenged me over and over this week as I've read this scripture. And Lord, I pray today that we would have our hearts ready to what you would have for us today. Lord, help us to be honest with ourselves. Who are we really? Do we really love you? Do we really? We say we love you. We're here today and we, we say that we love you. But Father, what does our heart say? Because, Lord, I find today that many people are found all other places besides the house of God. 
Lord, if we truly loved you, we would serve you fully. Lord, the reason why the church is straying away, the reason why we have what we have today is because we have done exactly what Jerusalem have done in this passage. We have removed our hearts far from you. And so, Lord, help us today to understand the meaning of the sermon. Understand that you're a loving God that desires our devotion and our dedication. And Lord, we'll thank you for that. In your precious and holy name we do pray. Amen. And amen. I want us to look at a few things and we'll be done and we'll be out of here. I want us to look, number one, at Jerusalem's condition. Let's look at their condition. God tells them their condition. When we look at the chapter and we look at verse 13, we understand that they say with their mouth that they were of God, but God says they were not. They worship God with their tongue, but not with their heart. They worship God with their actions, so to speak, but in their heart they are far from God. They were doing a little thing here, a little thing there, and God basically says, I'm concerned with your heart. I'm concerned with who you really are and how you have removed your heart. You have left me. The idea here, God is saying, you have left me. I want us to understand, when it comes to straying from God, God never moves. Say amen if you believe that. God never moves. What does He tell them in this passage? Who has done the moving? Jerusalem. They removed their heart far from God. They did the moving. God didn't. God has always been where He always will be. God is where He's at. And if anybody's moved in this sanctuary, it is you and me and not God. God says, you've moved from me. You no longer... You no longer love me like you used to love me. You no longer get on fire for me like you used to. You know, you come to church and I'm glad you're here, God says. But your heart is far away from here. You know, I've discovered the modern American Christian almost looks at Sunday morning church as a check off on the checklist. Check, did that. Check, put my tithe in the plate. Check, did that. But we totally lose the point on why we do those things and why we're doing it. Motive. Did you know that God is concerned with your motive? God don't want you just here. He doesn't want your body just here. He wants your heart here. He doesn't want... He doesn't want your actions... He wants the heart from which the actions flow. That is what God is telling these wayward children of His that they had moved their heart away from Him. They lived as though they were fooling God. Look at verse 15 in Isaiah 29. Look what God says to to them. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. And their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us and who knoweth us? Well, we're seeing their condition. They didn't... They were living the way they wanted to live and thought they were doing it in the dark. Who sees us? Oh, I can come and play church. Nobody would know the difference. And when it comes to me, you're absolutely right. I may not know. I may not pick up on it. Your person beside you may not pick on it. Pick on this morning. Pick on that fact. But I want to tell you something this morning. That no matter where your heart is, God knows all about your heart this morning. There is nothing in the dark when it comes to God. He knows everything. You see, we live in such a way that we're fooling God. The simple fact of the matter is, no one fools God. I mean, we live in such a way that we can be flippant. And and, and when the doors are open in the church, we don't have to come anymore. We let other things stray us away. We let other priorities lead us down another road. I'm going to say something here. and I don't want to offend nobody, but this is the Word of God. Hell will sell Frosties before I let a sports program dictate whether I'm going to be in church or not. The soul of my children the soul of my children 
is more important than anything that I possess, anything that I have. What's happened in our lives? What's happened in our hearts? What's happened? And it's not just church attendance, it's other things. It shows that we have removed our heart from God. You see, if the heart is right, everything else is right. You get it? If our heart is right with God, then nothing else. Look, what I really need to be doing as a preacher is preaching to the heart every Sunday. You want to know why? Because if I could preach to the heart, and our hearts and my heart get right with God, we could see revival. Because if the heart is right, everything else is right. The fact of the matter is we've allowed our hearts to stray away from God. You see, the Bible says they were hypocrites. God's really saying here, they were hypocrites. They said they loved God, but their heart was far from God. From the outside looking in, oh, let me tell you, they look great. But God saw their hearts. Matter of fact, God uses this very verse in the New Testament in Matthew chapter uh, 5 or 15, verses 7 through 8. He uses this chapter to combat the Pharisees. Because what were the Pharisees? Hypocrites. Matter of fact, in the verse, He calls them hypocrites. He says, you know, they're supposed to be the religious elite of Jesus' day. They are supposed to be the ones that if you've got a biblical question, you need to run to them. But Jesus looks at the religious elite and He says, you're hypocrites. And He uses Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13 to tell them so. You have a, a mouth that says you love God, but your heart is far from Me. I'm not your priority. I'm not your desire. In essence is what God was saying. They professed to be something that they were not. They were going through the motions. And let me tell you something about the modern church today. It is a church that is going through the motions. We do, we give, and we, we say we love God, but our desire for God is not there. How do I know that? Because we let everything pull us away from God's house. Oh, preacher, it's not like that at all. You see, our actions speak louder than our words. I'm just here today to tell you as your pastor, I love you. And I look at our world today. And this sermon's not popular, folks. But let me tell you, if we're going to see revival in our land, it'll be because we've gotten our hearts back to God. This is key this morning. They were facing, if you look at verses 1 through 16 in Isaiah 29, God was getting ready to judge them. He was getting ready to send judgment. Matter of fact, if you notice verse 1, He calls them Ariel. Now Ariel is just another name for Jerusalem, but it also, He had a point in saying that. It actually means the burning, the hearth burning of the altar. What He's basically telling them is, if they don't get their heart right with God, He was going to put them and reduce them down to rubble. He was going to burn them up to ash if they did not get their hearts right with God. And because their hearts were far away from God, He was sending judgment. Let me tell you folks, you want to know why we're facing all the troubles we're facing in America today? Because our heart is far from God. You want to know why we only got the choices that we got for president? I, and I heard a preacher say it this week. Here's what he said. He said, I believe we've got what we've got because God's given us exactly what we deserve. Because we as a church haven't stood up like we should. We as a church no longer, I'm talking to the church folks, I'm not talking to world folks. The church folks, their heart has come far away from God. And when you walk away from God in the heart, God sends judgment. This is what we see going on in the passage. They were facing the judgment of God. That was their condition. Well, their problem, we've kind of been talking about it all through the sermon. There was a condition, but then there was a problem. God said, they had removed their heart far from me. They had a heart problem. They had a situation with the heart. They were worshiping God and living for God according to the word of man. Notice in verse 13, he says... And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. The word fear there is a Hebrew word meaning worship. So what he's saying is their worship and service to God, they did as they were taught by the teachings of man. 
Boy, if that ain't today, I'll eat your dirty gym socks. Here's what we got today. And I've heard it in Free Will Baptist churches for about 15 years now. Well, preacher, I know what you said, but I don't see it that way. We've allowed the world to tell us it's okay to miss Sunday night and Wednesday night. We've allowed the world to do that. And we feel fine doing it. Let me tell you something. If you miss church when the doors are open and you feel fine about it, you need to get saved. Because the Bible says if we're saved, we're going to want to be in the house of God. The Bible says we're saved, we're going to have a heart for God. You see, God said they removed their heart far from me. But what we've done is we've allowed some man to say, oh, it's okay. It's okay. We've got a lady now, I mentioned on Wednesday night, a book is being written that tells you that it's okay as a Christian to have sex outside of marriage. And it's okay as long as in moderation. It's okay. Where in the Bible does it say that? Nowhere. But what's happened? We've allowed the teachings of man, the fact that man says it's okay, to drive us far away from God. Oh, our mouth, we speak. Oh, I love Jesus. You see, God doesn't want your lip service. He wants your heart service. And y'all can write that down. God does not want your lip service. He wants your heart service. And that's what's going on in America today. That's what's going on with the churches. That's what's going on. Hey, I fight it every day. Can I, can I be personal with you just for a second? I forgot about Brother Jeff being gone this morning. How many of you noticed I was running around like a turkey with his head cut off? I'm going to be honest with you. Leading music. <laughs> doing announcements. And, and, and then I have to preach a sermon. And then baptism. And... You know, and, and I'm, I'm, it's like I'm being told to do the, And I was in that room changing those, our, our deacons are helping me in. And God said, why are you doing this? Why are you in a panic? You're doing this for me. You're not trying to impress nobody. Here I am. I, I'm so, can, I, can I just, I'm so worried about what our, my people think. I don't want none of you to look out here and see anything unorganized. Now the Bible says to do everything decently and in order. Correct. You're right. And we should do everything decently and in order. But sometimes, I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes I as a pastor can be more concerned with a program than reaching hearts. And God got a hold of my heart in that baptistry room and said, you're wrong. You need to quit worrying about all those things. And you need to preach the word I've given you. Because my people need it. You need it. I'm telling you, look out in our land today. I look at our church. And I look at families falling away from God. In the five years I've been here, I've seen it. And they stray, and they stray, and they stray to the point they're in my office asking me why. And then I begin to tell them why. Not I told you so. But in a loving way. You strayed your heart from God. And when you walk away from God, judgment follows. You want to know why your kids are a mess? You want to know why your kids don't have a heart for God? You want to know why your kids are all in those other... Now that's not necessarily true all the time. But a lot of times. It's because they watch mommy and they watch daddy not have a heart for God. Lip service. Actions and motions, but no heart. Folks, this morning is so important that our hearts be close to God. They were worshiping God and living for God according to the word of man. And let me tell you, I don't care what man tells you that this is okay and that is okay. We need to be basing everything on this book right here. This is what I'm preaching. This morning, you may be mad with me. I understand that this is not popular. I probably made a few people mad. That's okay. I'm in good company because you know why? I'm preaching the Word of God. God did not call me to a popularity contest. He called me to preach the Word instant in season, out of season. That means when it's popular and when it's not. You're right. I lead a lonely life. <laughs> That's all right. I'm not really alone. God's with me. <laughs> 
Folks, this morning I preached with no pride. I preached with no hate. I preached with love. Because if we want to see things happen, we've got to get our heart right with God. I'm talking to me. I just gave you an illustration where I have strayed. And I'm telling you, folks, I'm glad when God shows up, even in a Baptist who calls it. <laughs> God will set us straight. He has that way. They are putting the thoughts of man above the word of God. A lot live today on the basis of I think and not thus saith the word of God. That's where we're at. It is clear then and today the problem lays in the heart of man. God is concerned with the heart. Just look. Let's look at some verses this morning and we'll be done. The heart of man by itself is wicked. What does the Bible say there? Look at Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9. There it is on the screen. He says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart and try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. What is God saying here? The heart without God is wicked. You and I, without God, our heart is wicked and dark. That's why we need the blood of Jesus, folks, to cleanse us from our sins. What else about the heart? Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that it guards our heart. Look at Proverbs 4.23. What does he tell us? The word keep there means guard in the Hebrew. Guard thy heart with what? All diligence. He's saying with all that's within you, guard your heart. It's the most important thing you have. Why is that? Look at it. Four. Four is, he's, asked, he's telling us why to guard our heart. Out of it are the issues of life. The idea here is, why are we to guard our heart? Because that is who we really are. It's where our decisions are made. It's where our thoughts are pondered. It's the directions that we take all come from our heart. And that's why we need to get our heart in tune with God. God says, guard your heart. Because you've got man saying one thing today. He's telling you all kinds of things. He's telling you it's okay to live in sin. There's churches this morning that will make you feel good while you're in sin. There's churches this morning that will make you feel like warm and fuzzy when you walk out the door. And I'd love to do that. But I can't do that this morning because God says it's time for us to get our hearts back to God. And God says a way to do that is to guard our hearts. Because man is telling you one thing, the devil is telling you another, the world is telling you all kinds of things, the internet is telling you all kinds of things, there's all kinds of other people and gurus trying to tell you all kinds of things, and God says that's why you need to guard your heart and keep it in tune with my word. This is the filter, folks. You want to know why I believe what I believe? Because the Bible says it. I don't need... James Dobson, James Dobson, and I love James Dobson, but I don't need James Dobson to tell me everything. I don't need Joe Osteen to tell me everything. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing, by the way. I don't need T.D. Jakes telling me everything. He can shuffle all around that stage, but if he tells me something contrary to the Word of God, he's wrong, and God is right. Again, folks, I'm not trying to hit on your favorite preachers. What am I talking about? Guard your heart. Because I've heard other preachers say things that were unbiblical and caused a family to walk away from God. Folks, it's important to guard our hearts. What's the key to God? Jeremiah 29, 13 is the next verse. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your mouth. Is that what's said? I think we're seeing a pattern here. God is interested in the heart. What does God say here? He says, you will find me when you find me with all your desire. Let me ask you a question. How are you finding God in your life if God is on the last of your priority list? How are you and I finding God and having a relationship with God when God is the last thing we think about? When the things of God and the church house and the activities of God and, and doing for God are the last things we think about. We put all kinds of things ahead of God in our relationship with Him. How long has it been since you opened your Bible on a daily basis and just began to read and fellowship and pray with God? How long has it been? You see, here's the thing. The Bible says you will find God only when you find Him with your whole heart. That knocks out half the modern church right there. You say, preacher, boy, you come up here with an agenda today. No, I came here today to warn you and me. 
I was guilty of this in the choir room. Our hearts are far from God. Time to get it back. You see, our heart is the key to living right before God. Luke 6, 30, or 6, 20, 45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is what? Good. The word good in the Greek means morally excellent. It's the idea of doing all that you can for God. It's doing the good things. It's being faithful to God. He says, hey, if you have a good heart, then you will do those good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Wow. Jesus just said a mouthful there. Jesus pretty much outed most of us, amen? You see, here's the thing. If our heart's right with God, we're going to live right. <laughs> That's what he's saying. If our heart is not right with God, then we're not going to live right. It's that easy. It's the key. Our hearts this morning are the key to living right before God. Well, our final point this morning, number three. What is the solution? I, it'd be a shame for me to preach this message and not give you a solution. They had a problem. God said... That their heart was far from them. They had removed their heart. They were away from God. They strayed away from God. They needed to get their heart right. God says if you want salvation, God says if you want redemption, you've got to come back. Not just your mouth, not just your money, your heart. Your heart! You know, I began to study this and God began to show me these things. And it, I just, I don't know why it's never dawned on me before. But as you look in Scripture, these these people in Jerusalem knew exactly how to get back with God. You want to know how I know? If you look at a study in the Old Testament, they were given commands when they got bondage out of Egypt. And then they were given command again. And then they were given command again. And all the time, this same command was given to them. And Jesus even gives them the command in the New Testament. That tells me that they knew how to get back to God. Well, let's look at a few of those verses. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord. Again, this is in the early days of the nation of Israel. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine what? Heart. And with all thy soul. And with all thy might. So Moses tells them, Hey, this is a commandment of God. Love God with all your heart. All your being. All your desire. He's first place. But then a few years go by and Joshua takes the mantle. And they're getting ready to split up. It's very interesting what Joshua tells them. Joshua could have said a lot of things, but here's what Joshua said. But take diligent heed. There's that diligence again. Take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you to what? Love your Lord your God and to walk in His ways and to keep His commandments and to cleave unto Him and to serve Him with all your what? Heart and with all your soul. See, this ain't nothing new. They knew exactly what God wanted. But then we travel to the New Testament several hundred years later. Jesus is asked, that's well, right here on your screen, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? He says, what's the greatest thing that we can do to serve you? And folks, this is why it's so important for you and I to wrap our heads around this. I, I'm not here to hate on nobody. Some of us need to give our life truly to Jesus. Oh, preacher, I'm, I'm saved. If your life doesn't back that up, you need to come down here and get saved. If your life does not back up a desire, folks, look, hell is in the balance. Let me tell you, folks, if things were to end today and your heart is not right with God, you could spend an eternity in a devil's hell. This is not something to be mocked at. This is not something to get mad at. This is, not so, this is something to respond to and receive. Because God loved you so much that He bled and died on an old Roman cross. He shed His blood for your sin and my sin. If we'll just walk away from our sin and trust in Him, He will save us. And God tells His children this. He says, you want to know how you can please me the greatest? Here's what he said. Master, which is the greatest law in the commandment? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt give a million dollar check to the church and offer plate. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt be faithful to this and that. No. Here's the thing. God understands the heart. 
He says, out of it, the issues of life flow. So he understands that if our heart's right with him, we will give to the church and we will be faithful to his house and we will do all the things that is expected of a Christian if our heart is right. That's why God says the greatest commandment and the greatest thing that we can do is this. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy mouth. No, with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Isn't that interesting, folks? Here's the point. It is clear from the beginning of time. This is all God has ever wanted of you and me, our hearts. He wants all of us or nothing. He does not just want our bodies in church. He wants our hearts in church. He doesn't just want our money. He wants the heart behind the money. He does not want us to serve Him just because, but to serve Him because that is who we are on the inside. A genuine love for Him and to please and follow Him with our whole heart. Can I tell you in this closing illustration, I, uh, I used to play basketball. I know you don't believe me now. I'm, half, I'm double the person I used to be. But I used to love basketball. Man, I, I'd eat, sleep, and breathe it. And I'm going to be honest with Miss Meyer, I really wasn't that good when I first started out. We lost every game. I lost every single game in my seventh grade year. And then we got a coach. And I wanted to be better. And so you know what I did? I had to do something that my flesh didn't want to do. Raise your hand if you know what a suicide is. Can I tell you something? I was telling the kids this at youth rally last night. I hate suicides. When I walk into a gym floor to this day, I get fear because I'm taught, you know, you run to the, 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 the inbounds line, to the, to the foul shot line, and you run back. And then you run all the way to the half court line, and you run back. And look, one time's enough for me. But let me tell you, we had to do it over and over and over and over and over. I was hot. I was tired. I was, but, but you know what? I did what it took. Why? Because my heart was in that basketball game. I did what I could to the point of sacrificing appointments. There were things that, that I wanted to do, but I knew that if I was going to be a good basketball player, and if I wanted to play, I needed to be there. Now I went to a Christian school, and we didn't have, the, we didn't have to worry about games on Wednesday night. Matter of fact, anytime I asked my dad, can I play sports? You know what my dad told me? As long as Wednesday night's free, as long as Sunday's free, and don't be messed with, you can do it. But you're not going to be down at the gym on Wednesday night. I thank God for a dad that said no. But my point on this is this. I did everything it took to be. Matter of fact, it come to the point, Brother Bommy, I became the starting center for Jacksonville Christian Academy. And boy, I had fun. And we got to the point where we got second place in our tournament. Boy, I had fun winning. When I was at the top, I was glad that I spent all that toil. But I couldn't have done it without the heart. You see, a lot of us look at church like those suicides. Oh, I got to go listen to that bug-eyed preacher slobber sling and everything else. Oh, if I could just sleep in for another hour on Sunday morning. I'm with you, folks. You know the hardest morning I get up, it might surprise you, is Sunday morning. And I don't know why that is, but I think that's what all of us... Oh, if I could just have one more hour. What are we doing? We're running those suicides. Boy. But what we need to realize is it's those suicides that make us better. <laughs> it's these things like you're doing this morning, hearing the Word of God, that makes you a better person for God. Makes you a better Christian. Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, really. Maybe you've been playing church. You can come in here and say, well, preacher, I'm saved. I got saved way back when, but there's never been any evidence in your life to that. You need to come and get saved. Give your heart who you are to God. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning as musicians